It's amazing what a steely reserve, loyal family, and a razor blade stuffed in the bill of your cap can get you. Mostly trouble, honestly. But you get to wear a nice suit in between. Peaky Blinders posits a world where the Birmingham Street Gang beat Billy Kimber and the Birmingham Boys and took over their territory in 1910 instead of the other way around. Led by Tommy Shelby and bolstered by his war vet brothers, that one change causes the rise and then fall of the blended Romani and Irish family. Like all good tales, you pass the things on the way down that you did on the way up. So let's look at the seeds of doom and hidden details of season six from the folks at a small heath. Is there a big heath? A just right heath? Not important. Let's go. Steely-eyed determination and wild ambition can be a troublesome combination for anyone who has to come along for the ride. Each new season sees Tommy doing his best to be the hungriest hungry hippo in all of Great Britain, often leaving his family to take the brunt of the blowback. This has led to a drug and alcohol addiction, crazy mood swings, three caravans full of resentment, and a not insignificant amount of dead bodies. By season three, Tommy has had a large enough sample size to determine who's the architect of his own woes, but a jilted Russian duchess gives Tommy another possible explanation. The sapphire that his wife Grace wore is cursed, naturally. <laughs> Does your wife know that the sapphire she's wearing has been cursed by a gypsy? As if to drive that point home, when Tommy goes to Grace to ask her to take it off, she catches a bullet meant for Tommy instead. He takes the supposedly cursed sapphire to an elder Romani woman who calls Tommy out on his desire to have the sapphire absolve him of his guilt. But Tommy isn't in a self-reflective mood, so she agrees. It's cursed. Season 6 sees the theory of the cursed sapphire gain a little more credence when Tommy finds out that a seven-year-old girl died just a day after wearing the sapphire. Now, Tommy's in a curse cascade as the mother of the child is believed to have skipped the middleman and just cursed Tommy that he'd lose his child at the same age. Which he promptly does when Ruby dies. The shadow that Sapphire cast in Season 3 ended up darkening Season 6. Horses, of course, play a big part in the rise and fall of the Shelby clan. Their first power move was to take over the betting at the local racetrack and establish a legitimate off-track betting center. Tommy even buys a racehorse partially to flex on Inspector Campbell over Grace choosing him. But it's not just betting and rubbing things in that horses are used for in the series. Most notably, the opening and closing shots. We first meet Tommy riding a black racehorse into the Chinese sector of town, making a big show of the horse getting a whiff of some magic powder. It's all a setup to convince people to bet on the horse until everyone is doing it and then have the horse lose. It's also our first introduction to the wheels within wheels planning that will become Tommy's normal operating method throughout the series. Images of horses end up in the set dressing throughout the series as well. What the showrunner has referred to as the White Horse of Hope appeared on the Shelby Gin labels, as well as white and black horses symbolizing both hope and despair. To mirror the first shot of the series, Tommy gives up the life and the worldly possessions that came with it and rides off on a white horse of hope to a future free of his previous state of constant war. Now, one thing that filmmakers can't get enough of is tucking little references and nods to their favorite movies or favorite classroom or even just their favorite library sound in their projects. One of the most storied and referenced movies when it comes to nods is Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of the Stephen King novel, The Shining. In that movie, a lot happens in Room 237, the room where the ghost of Lorraine Massey haunted the family after having taken her own life. Now, season 5 closes with Tommy on the verge of doing the same, and it opens with him trying only to find out that the bullets have been removed from his gun. From Room 237, the inner peace Tommy managed to foster during the time jump is slowly eroded by one tragedy after another until he's told that he's dying and decides to take it in stride and use his powers for good for a change. Was this a harbinger of Tommy's descent into accepting his own death, or just a fun nod to a notorious film? After all, the room had to have some number on it. Now, while Room 237 may or may not have been a harbinger of doom, a Romani phrase that an ill Ruby uttered to Lizzie from her sickbed probably was. Tommy isn't there to hear it, so he has to get it secondhand from Lizzie, who doesn't speak Romani. Of course, neither do we. Series creator Stephen Knight told Digital Spy that it was a difficult phrase to translate, but that it means devil among other not great things. A strict translation has the phrase saying, little girl, death or kill, and devil. Now, at the heart of season six has been whether or not Tommy is the devil. 
His brother Michael thinks he is. His wife Gina is a bit on the fence about it. Now, the woman who lost her child to a cursed sapphire, well, she's pretty sure he is. Given that, it could be interpreted to mean that the devil, Tommy, will lose his young daughter. Ruby's accompanying vision of a man with green eyes is enough to send Tommy into panic mode, cutting Ruby off entirely. You know, Michael thinks you're the devil. And I think you might actually be right. If there is one thing that filmmakers love as much as sneaking in nods to their favorite movies, it's sneaking in the names of themselves and various members of the crew. For the fake credits in the show within the show on WandaVision, they were all made up of the post-production team, all given above-the-line promotions. Even The Simpsons tucks away the name of the theme composer Danny Elfman in the opening credits as the name of a store. The set decoration team gave the director of seasons 5 and 6, Anthony Byrne, a nod by way of a business on Miquelon Island, Entreprise Antoine Negoce de Poisson, a fish trader. Now This could go alongside his other business, A. Byrne Grocer, which made an appearance in the fifth season finale. British shows refer to each run as a series instead of a season, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just say season. At the beginning of the series, see how confusing that could get? Polly had a singular driving ambition to see if the kids that were taken from her by the parish authority are still alive. Polly tells the story of her husband who died by being caught between a boat and the edge of the canal while drunk. Now, at the time, and for decades later, in one way or another, Britain had a policy of forced adoptions, generally through childhood wellness organizations often tied to the church. One of the things that would trigger the removal of the kids was being a single mother based on the assumption that they were inherently unfit. She mentions that she was reported by a neighbor as well, with a hint that the Church of England didn't hold the Romani travelers in high regard. Polly wasn't legally allowed to know where her children were until they were 18, but the Shelbys do a lot of things that they aren't legally allowed to do. Tommy found out that her daughter had died, but made contact with her son Michael, who made the snap decision to rejoin the Shelby clan. Over the course of the show, he goes from nervous novice to Macbeth, with his mother whispering in his ear to take control of the Shelby Empire from an increasingly ambitious and erratic Tommy. Michael even proposes a plan in which Tommy would take on an alias to continue to benefit from the Shelby Empire, but take on a more silent leadership role in favor of the new head, Michael. The alias is a Mr. Jones. Tommy throwing the plan in the fire and moving on as if Michael hadn't said anything sets up the Battle of the Cousins over the last two seasons. Under the pretense of a truce for expanded business, Tommy met with Michael, who is now part of his wife's crime family run by Uncle Jack. The meeting ends with Tommy giving Michael a sample of the heroin that is part of their new criminal venture to replace alcohol after the repeal of Prohibition. Tommy promptly drops a dime on his cousin to the Boston authorities to take Michael out of play and to put Uncle Jack in an awkward position. When he reports him, he uses the alias his cousin had suggested for him, Mr. Jones. This meeting of Birmingham and Boston gangs took place on Miquelon Island. The residents of Miquelon were lamenting the repeal of Prohibition. That's because the island, under the French colonial flag, was as close as you could get to Prohibition America while not actually being in America. During Prohibition, the islands in that archipelago were used by alcohol smugglers, which brought a lot of money to the island. Now that alcohol could walk through the front door, their booming economy was bust. It's also the beginning of the end for the feud between Michael and Tommy, which itself had a little bit of symbolism as the name Miquelon is thought to be Michael in Basque. Peaky Blinders has fairly consistently blended real history with made-up history, including real historical figures who interact with the made-up Shelby family. For instance, Sir Oswald Mosley, the fascist leader who befriends Tommy, is a real figure in British history who legitimately campaigned for fascism in Britain before the Blitz made it a big no-sale on the island. Billy Kimber is also a real figure and leader of the Birmingham Boys, who took over from the Peaky Blinders, at least the official gang, in 1910, around when the series starts. Some characters are based on real figures, but with enough changes or a way to directly imply that's how they'd interact with the Shelbys. Most notable is Uncle Jack Nelson, a powerful criminal leader in Boston and, like Tommy, a political mover and shaker. The character is inspired by another Jack with a criminal to legit transformation, Jack Kennedy, grandfather to John F. Kennedy and all the rest of the Kennedys that went into politics. The music for Peaky Blinders is one of the standout elements that ends up giving it that unique feel. Instead of going with period music, it's a pastiche of dark college rock songs from artists like The White Stripes, Radiohead, Arctic Monkeys, Iggy Pop, and Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, who provided the theme for the series, Red Right Hand. 
While the song predates the show, its lyrics gel well with the theme of it, and the brooding guitar sets the tone for the series. After initial reluctance to use modern music for a period piece, star Killian Murphy began taking an active hand in curating the music for the show. It's been popular enough to have a soundtrack album and even a tour of the music of Peaky Blinders. But no song is more associated with the show as much as Red Right Hand. The term comes from Milton's Paradise Lost as a symbol for divine vengeance, a recurring theme on the show. In the sixth season, director Anthony Byrne included a little bit of a nod to the show's theme by naming the gin that Ada drinks Red Right Hand. Now, when Tommy decides to take his own life only to find out that his gun wasn't loaded, he drops down to the mud, emotionally spent. When he rises up, the mud covers half of his face in a neat way, reminiscent of Batman foe Two-Face. Now, while Tommy has let a few important things ride on the flip of a coin, the real, more direct allegory is what Tommy struggles with the entire last season, trying to live in both the light and the dark, and whether or not straddling that line is even possible. Throughout the rest of the episode, he's lit with a dark and light side until he decides to give up all the trappings of his criminal enterprise and commune with his roots, allowing the light to cover his entire face. Now, the entire show has always had a lot of detail to reflect the narrative in the sets, adding to the show's atmosphere. For season six, Tommy finds that all of his triumphs pushing his family to larger and larger success has not ended up satisfying. He has dead family members. The ones who are alive are in disarray, and all of his money and power have just become a giant machine that he has to maintain. To help drive that home, the sets would frequently feature black with gold highlights to indicate the corruption of money. Even more directly, the bathroom floor where Tommy had his seizure was black with gold veins, which was meant to evoke the coming death of Ruby, specifically the practice of actually giving her gold in an attempt to abate the disease unsuccessfully. The black and gold contrast evoked the futility of the gold, with his wealth unable to prevent his daughter's death. Now, there's a really easy go-to when you have a hero having their last meal before meeting their inevitable fate. But for it to really tap that whole Last Supper vibe, there has to be a Judas who fulfills his role to trigger the actions that make this the Last Supper. Now, after donating much of his wealth and property to charity and low-income assistance, Tommy goes back to his Romani traditions via an outdoor banquet with his family, where he tries to say goodbye without specifically saying goodbye. A vision of Ruby hipping him to the fact that his doctor was in cahoots with Tommy's enemy would stop Tommy from ending a life that he thought was effectively over anyway. But he didn't know that at the time. Set designer Nicole Northridge had a different inspiration for Tommy's farewell banquet, the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. This was achieved primarily by juxtaposing the trappings of luxury pulled from his former estate gathered in the field in the shade of a tree and the traveler wagons surrounding the gathering. Northridge presented it as a sign about how little Tommy now cared about these trappings of wealth he had fought so hard to achieve. Holly's death was not part of the plan for season six, but the untimely passing of actor Helen McCroy during the pandemic delay meant that she would only be appearing in flashbacks. Her death at the hands of the IRA had to be quickly worked into the story. In the show, Polly was killed in order to have one less thing that Tommy can lean on, hopefully making Tommy more reliant on Captain Swing and not, you know, newly resolved to get revenge over the death of his aunt, even if the family was at odds. I mean, in the last 15 years, has Tommy and the rest of the Shelbys given any indication that they let things go? It was a bad plan that turned out badly for them. It did mean that the show was able to do its own send-off for the character and the actor who had added so much drama to the show. The Burning of Rivardo included a collection of mementos from the character, including set photos from the first season and a recreation of a painting that Polly had done in an earlier season. The costume department worked with Northridge to include key parts of her wardrobe, as well as including a pair of gloves and boots that were important in establishing the look of her character. Now, Ruby's death was not only planned, but telegraphed across seasons. For her Vardo, they went so far as to include details that never made it on camera. Keeping with the black and gold theme, her coffin was painted with ornate gold decorations. Inside the Vardo were wreaths decorated with black feathers and a return of the white horse motif. In her interview with Den of Geek, Northridge pointed to another design detail that might have gone unnoticed in Ruby's room. She had created a little diorama of her father's office with cutout figures for Tommy, Polly, Lizzie, and of course, a white horse. Now, when season six went into production, creator Stephen Knight indicated that season seven had already been plotted out. 
After the delays and loss of a key cast member, it was eventually decided that season 6 would be the last run for the show. But that's not the end. The show has reached Abed from Community's threshold for success. Six seasons and a movie. The intent from the beginning was to have the story span the time between the two world wars and the final episode ending as the first air raid sirens sound. Now that the seventh season will be a movie, instead, Knight plans to take the story into the war as those in the younger generation like Duke end up on the front lines. Oh, but they're not done yet. Collaborating with the dance company Rambar Productions, as well as some Birmingham theaters and choreographer Benoit Swan Pouffet, they'll create the dance show The Redemption of Thomas Shelby, which covers the romance between Tommy and Grace from the first two seasons of the show. Peaky Blinders does a really good job of highlighting the importance of a really intense stare. It's a real time saver when you don't really want to respond to the threats or insults of the person you're talking to. You just don't, and you give them a nice, steely-eyed stare. 